So, uh, welcome. This is uh, welcome to this evening's um, uh, dialogue uh, with Alex Chow and, and Professor Lloyd Dialog. And this is, as many of you know, this is uh, one of our events uh, organized by UBC Hong Kong Studies Initiative. Uh, my name is Liu Xin. I teach in the Department of History and Asian Studies, uh, and I'm also a convener for the for the initiative. Um, again, as part of my salesman mode, I always like to say that um, one of one of the things that we want to do in in, in UBC uh, since 2005, 2006 um, was to has been to promote the study of Hong Kong, um, parts through our language program. Uh, and also in parts through various courses, uh, we are offering Hong Kong cinema, Hong Kong history. Uh, we this term we didn't do so, but uh, we like to think of we like to offer Hong Kong a course on Hong Kong literature regularly. Um, and we are hoping in the this coming fall we are going to offer a course on on Cantonese music. For those who are in the back, you can there's there's still seats, right? So feel free to come and sit down. Um, so all in all, we um, I cannot really well. We we I like to claim, but we cannot really claim that we have a program. <laughs> um, we like to think that we do have a robust list of courses for students who are interested in Hong Kong to to take classes in. Um, so so this is what we uh, like to do, and we would like to do it as much as we can. And and part of that larger project is to promote the discussion of Hong Kong um, and to place Hong Kong's experience in a broader context. So we are very, very uh, fortunate uh, today to welcome Alex Chow and Professor Lloyd to, uh, to come share with us. So before we start, I just want to say a number of thank yous. Uh, I'd like to thank the, the sponsor for, for our event today, uh, the Department of Asian Studies, the Department of History, the Center for Chinese Research, um, the Department of Political Science and St. John's College. Um, I also like to thank our various students helpers to help us um, make it happen. It's very important. Uh, we like to thank arts, arts IT people. Very helpful, Taha. Thank you. Um, and I also want to, before we start, please turn off your cell phone um, and anything that beeps, that would be good. The format today is in the form of a dialogue, um, and, and, and I do mean a dialogue. That means I'm, I, um, yeah, what does that mean, I'll tell you. <laughs> they don't know yet, but, but this is, so in the form of a dialogue, um, and because I do know that you want to interact with our audience, right? You want to hear what our students have to say, uh, you want to hear what our faculty, our have to say. So we would like to maximize the component of the Q&A session. So that would be good. So we'll, we'll limit ourselves to about 15 minutes. Um, our session goes from 5.30 to 7, so about, um, so from about um, uh, until 5.30 to 6.20, and then we'll, we'll, we'll go from there. Um, and uh, we will, there are a number of questions that we have prepared, or at least some of the topics that we have prepared, and, um, and then, um, and then some of the questions we will pursue further, and some of them we might just pass, pass over. So we'll, we'll see how it goes, right? It's a dialogue, it's a, it's a conversation. Another thing that I should mention is that um, yesterday, uh, Alex and Professor Lui had already done a Cantonese language workshop, uh, sorry, uh, dialogue at, in Richmond. And so, so the topic yesterday was, the, uh, was Hong Kong after the Umbrella Movement of 2014. So uh, when we designed this today's event, we chose to take another route, right? Uh, we don't want to cover the same topic, but I'm sure the umbrella movement or post umbrella movement Hong Kong would come into our discussion. Um, so we have a theme, and the theme is Hong Kong in the in the, in the age of the Chinese dream. Um, and but but I'm sure that the conversation will take different directions. Uh, my job as a moderator, and I do take very seriously my job as a moderator, is to moderate. Uh, what does that mean? It means that I will guide the discussion, I will ask questions, I will push our conversation in certain directions. 
I, of course, when we open up the floor for discussion, I'm happy and welcome your questions and your comments. Um, I think we have a microphone here. Uh, Kennedy will give us directions of how to use it uh, when the time comes. Uh, but I would ask you to limit your questions or comments to a reason reasonable amount of time. And I, as a moderator, I will step in and I will stop you if you go on for too long because we want to maximize uh, 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 time for discussion, right? So, so I, 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 I apologize in advance if I, if, I, if I ask you to give up the microphone. Okay. Um, other than that, I think we should, we should start to maximize our time. Okay, so um, let me ask, uh, so very briefly introduce uh, our speakers. Uh, Alex Chow um, was uh, the Secretary General for the student, um, for the Confederations of, what is the name? Uh, the Confederations of Fed Hong Kong Students. Hong Kong Federation of Students. Hong Kong Federation, Confederations, sorry. I should have done my homework, right? So, <laughs> but of course, what Alex is, most known to us, of course, um, he was one of the leaders, or one of the leaders of the Umbrella Movement. He was also, uh, as a result, he was also uh, sentenced to prison uh, for seven months in 2017. And uh, we're very happy to see him. Uh, and we're very happy to see him now as a graduate student at uh, Berkeley studying geography. Some of the some of the audience here um, from the geography department. Right? I think they welcome your your, your membership in this new cohort. Um, and he's also involved in a number of other organizations of after his umbrella movement um, involvement. Maybe I would actually ask Alex to say something about one of these organizations that you are now. Right? Do you want? Anything to mention any one of them at this point? Um, you can, okay. 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 So, um, uh, and, and Professor Louis Dialog, I, I would also uh, introduce him very briefly. Professor Louis Dialog is, is one of, the, one of the, the scholars that I most admire, especially in the context of, of the study of Hong Kong. Uh, I could Give him. I mean, he's, uh, I can give him give you the titles. He's the vice president of the Education University of Hong Kong. He's a chair professor of Hong Kong studies. Um, I can also give you a whole list of of publications that he has done. But I want to do it in a different way. Right? <laughs> um, you can look at his publications in English and in, in Chinese. But I, I find Professor Lewis' writings in Chinese, if I may say so, uh, much. I, should, I have to choose my word carefully. <laughs> <laughs> Inspiring. Okay, I won't do any comparison. I would just say the Chinese writings in particular is inspiring. I like, I particularly like um, uh, your book, uh, Check Please, a sociologist notebook. Um, I also like the, the book on the 1970s Hong Kong. Right? So, um, so those are fascinating, um, fascinating, I mean, not in a sort of generic sense, but in the sense that it does open up uh, and challenge our conventional wisdom of, of Hong Kong history and Hong Kong's past. And I particularly, um, the two articles that I've always go, gone back to when I think about Hong Kong and Hong Kong history, uh, one article is uh, by uh, the late uh, P.K. Leung, uh, Yasi, right? Um, he had visited us at UBC, he was a good friend of UBC, and one of his seminal essays by Yasi was uh, about Hong Kong story, why it is so difficult to tell. Right? That's, that's, he wrote it in Chinese, but it is a very important uh, essay, um, reflection of why is it so difficult to talk about Hong Kong. Right? And Professor Liu also wrote an article, an, an essay, uh, on a similar theme on the Hong Kong story. And he also agrees that it is a very difficult story to tell. But I think uh, Professor Lewis' argument in that one is very provocative. And, and because, if I may do it in a very simple way, the argument is that because however much we talk about Hong Kong identity and Hong Kong values, um, we really haven't, we meaning people who care about Hong Kong, we think about Hong Kong a lot, haven't really given much thought about what goes into this 
this label that we call Hong Kong people and Hong Kong identity. And, and that is one of the sources of, of why it is difficult to tell the story of Hong Kong, because we, we haven't really thought much about the category itself. Anyway, I'll stop, because it's not about me. It's, it's about Professor. So, so we begin with this, right? We begin, we, so we have two um, distinguished visitors in, their, in, in different ways, and, and we'll begin. Um, so, so again, I'm mindful of time, and we'll go, we'll follow our agenda to a certain degree, but we will, we will depart. You can see that I don't really have a script. Um, so the first, the first the first question, or at least the first, first topic is, um, one country, two systems. I, th I think this is something that, that most of you would know what it is. It's a framework uh, laid down in 1983-84. It's part of a joint declaration uh, when Hong Kong and China agreed, oh sorry, when Britain and China agreed that, that Hong Kong would be reverted to Chinese rule in 1997. So within the framework of one country, two systems. And, and this has always come back to as a talking point in, in current debates, et cetera, et cetera, um, how well or how not well one country, two systems has been implemented in Hong Kong. So my first, topic, my first question is, if you were to give a grade, and because we are professors and we are students, we talk about grades, marking, right? A, B, C, D, E, failure. If you have to give a grade to how well the the, the one country, two, two systems has been implemented to Hong Kong. What grade would you give? <coughs> this will, I'll, I'll give it to, actually, I'll give it to Alex first. <laughs> uh, getting more conscious about the debate in Hong Kong and also the, the, the social event and also the political protests in Hong Kong. Actually, um, the grade F actually came to mind. Because to many youngsters, one country, two system actually failed Hong Kong people from the perspective of youngsters. Because they do feel like when we grow up, we were educated, being told that one country, two system is a promise that will uphold the principle of Hong Kong people ruling Hong Kong, high degree of autonomy, uh, including a set of package that Hong Kong will remain as a liberal city that would go through the process of decriminalization gradually to have a reform on the institution. We will have one people, one vote, and then we could elect our sitting leader. It would no longer be handpicked by uh, the Chinese government or even a small circle of elite who govern Hong Kong for decades. But that was not being actualized. So by 2000, 14, like students like me, when I was, while I was an undergraduate student, uh, that we read news, and we also, there was also social media, so there's a lot of things uh, that we could see and hear, and, and, and deepen our understanding about what's going on in Hong Kong, what's happening in Parliament, what is, what is it about for the social policy. Uh, does the government really serve the public? or does it really serve a small circle of elites? That became one of, one of the sort of ideas that is deeply implanted in youngsters' mind. People like me felt like something is going wrong. This is not what was told. We do not see any high degree of autonomy. We do not see a real reform that would change the institution that could allow one person to vote. Uh, we do not see the social policy actually uh, benefiting well, the general public. Well, where is the uh, uh, where is where is equity? Where is a policy about a more uh, fair and equal social housing scheme? How do land be used to further develop a city that will really serve our next generation and youngster and also would provide safety net for our elderly. We do not see those things happen in Hong Kong, so there must be something wrong. So we must 
look more carefully about the system, the so-called one country, two system. And when people have a closer examination, then people have more doubt about what happened in the past. Why it was drafted in this way, why some promise was not actualized, and what was going on. Was it really the ideas that was discussed and debated in the 80s, or it went another way? that was really different from the initial idea that really once gave hope to Hong Kong people. So from youngsters' point of view, it really felt a lot of people. And so the, so because you come back to this notion about autonomy, right? So, so because it didn't have, Hong Kong doesn't seem to have a high degree of autonomy, this, the, the, the framework of one country, two systems seems to have failed. Right? Yep. Okay. Okay. Um, well, first of all, thanks for the uh, very kind words in your introductory remark, and also thanks for the organizers uh, for making this um, two events possible. Uh, thanks so much for bringing me to UBC. Um, uh, what's the score? Uh, first of all, the first point I would like to make is uh, basically um, from day one, uh, one country, two system would not be able to attain an A or A plus score because structurally it was an outcome of a historical compromise. At the time of the 1980s when Hong Kong's future was under negotiation, it was about China, Britain, and also to some extent Hong Kong people have to reach a compromise. That for China, they're going to take back Hong Kong, but not to liberate Hong Kong. So as a socialist country, don't forget it was talking about China in the 1980s, not about now. If we are talking about China in 2018, of course, or 2019, of course, who cares about market or, 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 or capitalism, you know, it's, it's, it's part of everyday life. But it was the early 1980s, so it was a big deal to accommodate something like a capitalist beast in the context of a very kind-hearted socialist country context. So it was supposed to be a compromise. Um, and then they have to accommodate the fact that the way they manage Hong Kong would be very different from the way they manage any other city or any other province in mainland China, even up to now, quite honestly. Uh, I remember several years ago when I was visiting a notable university in, 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 in mainland, in, in, in that campus, for example, suddenly we, we, we were given the information that uh, the president of the university would not be president anymore. He was just asked to stay behind in Beijing on the way of traveling, so he won't come back. Um, so if you don't like anyone, you can just do it like this. But in Hong Kong, no matter how much they hate me as a vice president, if they want to get rid of me, they still need to work through a lot of procedures, uh, and that would take months or years. By the time my tenure would end, and then they would get rid of me. Um, so you know, for China, it's a compromise. For Britain, of course, in the 1980s, to hand back a former colony to a communist country, again, it was a big deal. So how are you going to work out a way that they can, you know, um, uh, withdraw from Hong Kong in a very gracious manner? And that was, you know, one country, two system as a guarantee in front of the international community that, you know, th this would be taken very, very seriously. For Hong Kong people, at that time, everyone wants to keep the status quo. Um, a lot of people probably have forgotten that at one point of time, actually, all kinds of ideas came up in Hong Kong, including how to uh, to exchange sovereignty with you know some sort of administrative power, and also you know one of the striking thing at that time pop up is someone for some very interesting reason proposed that there's supposed to be an outlying island north of the um, northern shore of Australia that they find out that you know that island would also be made up of made of granite the same type of land form of Hong Kong, and they also have Typhoon, all the good attributes of Hong Kong, they have all of that, and so it would be a good idea to move the entire Hong Kong, all the buildings, brick by brick, and to be settled there, and to restore Hong Kong after 1997, something like that. Of course, I never find out what the exact location of that island, but anyway, it was an interesting idea. And so at that time, everyone wants to keep the status quo, but what do you mean by saving, keep, keeping the status quo? You have to be returned to China. We don't want to have a return to China before 1997. So, okay, we are set one country, two system. So at least 
horse racing would continue, my club would continue that kind of idea. So it was a compromise. Uh, but the compromise means that none of the parties among China, Britain, and Hong Kong would take what they want. If you give 100% of the Hong Kong people's desire, then of course it's nothing changed. Just stay as British colony and that's full stop. And of course they have to compromise. So from day one, it won't be an A or A plus because they have to compromise. But what's the score? I would say perhaps I, I grew up in a Jesuit school. So a Jesuit secondary school means if you get 40 out of 100, they still pass. I don't know why they're so generous, uh, but that was, that was how I grew up. So my score given to one country, two system would at least be something like 45, 50. Of course, you will ask why a pass, given you know, all the challenges that Alex has just mentioned. I think it's still a pass because it still provides a framework that basically Hong Kong can still negotiate with Beijing. Of course, the degree of autonomy would be you know, a challenge, but still, it, it, it was a different system. We don't have a public cadre working in the university, and so on and so forth. So we still retain some of the crucial uh, special features of Hong Kong as, you know, as a special administrative region. So basically, it still works to a large extent. But we don't get a higher score because a lot of the assumptions, a lot of the parameters about Hong Kong and China change enormously prior to as well as after 1997. One of the issues that probably we'll come back to later on in the discussion. For example, in the original design of one country, two system, we believe that we can retain a certain significant degree of segregation of Hong Kong from the mainland. And at that time, we believe that if we talk everything about regional integration, it's about Hong Kong people making investment in China. It's about Hong Kong people spending the weekend in Shenzhen enjoying themselves there, and, and so on and so forth. No one before 1997, before 1995, have ever imagined that gradually this would become a two-way traffic between Hong Kong and China. Before 1997, no one would have ever thought that, you know, how would be a pregnant mother from China be interested in giving birth or baby in Hong Kong? Point number one, they need to apply visa to enter Hong Kong so they won't get a visa from, from China. Point number two, they can't afford it. Point number three, well, there won't be too many people of this kind. The outcome, of course, is actually after the year 2000, China will be more than happy to issue visa for their own residents to go out because they have consumption power. So Hong Kong will be one of those places, but not Hong Kong, then Macau, then Southeast Asia, anywhere. Point number two, gradually most people notice that going to Hong Kong and give birth a baby actually is very, very cheap and high quality medical services, so why not? And at the very beginning, Hong Kong people think, okay, it's fine to have middle class pet families to come to Hong Kong and give birth babies. That's all right, because these are rich people, they don't mind taking care of rich kids, so that's good. But once the gate was lifted, and then it turned out to be a flat gate, and then gradually you find the majority of babies given born in Hong Kong by the time of 2012, is becoming the majority coming from non local parents, and then you don't know what to do with it. And these are issues that you know have never thought about it. For example, in 2018, we have something like 51 million mainland tourists. I don't think Canada have that kind of we try. size of uh, tourism for the entire year for the whole country. Um, so it's very difficult to manage. Imagine that you have 51 million people visiting your place, city, not, not the entire Vancouver, just visiting Robson Street, 51 million of them a year, just interested in two streets. Mm -hmm. What would it be? Um, and it's overwhelmed. Um, this is one of the issues that, you know, like the assumption and parameters, one is changed, then the original frame that would not be quite able to enable Hong Kong to cope with it. And also the SAR government doesn't really care a lot about how to manage it. Mm. And therefore, you know, a lot are not being deducted. But then of course, we would also touch on the issue about autonomy and so on. So mm. it still manage a bare part, but probably not doing too well in terms of high scores. Thank you. Alex, do you have anything? Because I, I pick up the word compromise 
in 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 uh, Professor Lo's Lo's the comments. So an expectation of high autonomy versus a compromised version of understanding what actually that means is that a source of is that a source of tensions or or or, or, or dissatisfaction among the. I, I know you cannot speak for the, all the younger generation because it's unfair for you to, to, to speak for that. But just give us a sense of, is that a, is that a source of a problem? So most of the officials, they're turning themselves into entrepreneurs. And Hong Kong was also at a transition that was like tr transforming its economy. And also uh, more and more business people would go to China and, and invest. So I do feel like, well, if you look back at the 80s and 90s, it seems like there were several stages. So say like before 1989, before Tamil massacre happened in China, that was one stage. Before 1984, over like way before one, uh, the the declaration was drafted and signed, that was another stage. And after 1989, that was another stage. So we really have different stages that kind of change people's mind. So I think that explains why after 19, uh, after 1989. Uh, between that period, between 1989 and 1997, many Hong Kong people actually migrate to other places, like Vancouver. Uh, I do feel like many people realized that was uh, there was a threat and there was a real danger uh, that would be coming. And people didn't realize that in the 2000s because it seems like there are still some positive signals from China that as long as it liberalized its economy, then it would run through the second stage to liberalize its political system. But it doesn't seem to be the case right now. And many of the people in Hong Kong today would still say, um, uh, we have to give more time and see how China would, would go and what the trajectory would be. But to many youngsters, the youngsters were simply impatient because why people have to make compromise repeatedly when it always failed to really actualize things? And I think that was one of the questions that, that it's not easy to answer because it's really about faith and really you have trust. Mm. And that doesn't exist among a portion of the Hong Kong citizens right now. And I think that is one of the challenge. I want to move on to a different topic uh, because it, our, our, our general topic today is the Chinese dream. I don't know whether um, most of you or many of you have heard of this, this, this um, slogan or this aspiration uh, by President Xi Jinping. I think it, um, he first talked about it in 2012. It, it became uh, a much more regular presence in the, in the official, um, uh, I guess, official speeches and writings in starting in 2013. So as a slogan, the Chinese dream has been closely associated with, with the leadership of Xi Jinping. Um, I guess the question is, where do you think this idea came from? Uh, Professor, this for Professor Lui first. Where do you think this idea came from? And what functions has it served? <laughs> uh, it's, it's difficult to answer your question because you asked me where the, does it came from, and then my answer is very strict before. I don't know. <laughs> um, but uh, it depends on how you read um, slogans in mainland China. Because if you try to put the slogan in context, then you probably find a different layer to, to decode the message. For example, before the Chinese dream, or the Chinese dream is, of course, the idea of a harmonious society. But the harmonious society's idea came out in the context of the Beijing leadership gradually realized that in the context of new China, it is a socially stratified society. So before 1999, when I started to do my research on the uh, middle class in, 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 in Shanghai, I still remember that in 1997, when I was in you know different university in Shanghai and talk about my idea of doing some research on the middle class, most of my friends said, you know, we would help your research, but 
I'm not being more, I won't be involved because there's no class in China. Come on, don't ever mention about it. It's not supposed to, this is supposed to be a class society. How can you research on class? And at that time, 1997, you also need to recognize that there's no private property. So what class? So we will help you. We will find a way to help you, but thank you very much. Don't ever enlist me as co-investigator. <laughs> By 1999, I started to do my field work, um, and then because of all the department stores and advertising companies, they cook up the idea of white collar. White collar being equivalent to middle class, but don't ever mention class. So it's supposed to be white collar, but not our white collar. It's supposed to be very well paid white collar, working for foreign corporations. And then everyone can help me to find white collars and then we can talk about white collar without talking about middle class and so on. And also around that period of time, then of course the first report on social stratification and the class structure came out, recognizing there would be 10 classes in China. And of course, later on, you're know, not allowed to refer them as classes, but strata. But anyway, it doesn't really matter. It's, it's, it's a way to deal with it. But after recognizing there would be social strata, then suddenly there were an emergence of quite frequently a number of social conflicts in different provinces. So the recognition of the existence of classes and strata coincide with the context of growing social conflict. So what are you going to do? Then came in this idea of harmonious society. So if you read it from one perspective, it's telling you that you know you need to behave. This is supposed to be social harmony, so you know what to do. But at the same time, if you read it from the other perspective, it's telling you that actually the Beijing leadership is well aware well, well, of the fact that social conflict is growing, but don't ever mention it. By not mentioning it, then this will be managed. So the China dream, quite honestly, when it came out, I still remember that when I was visiting different universities in China. At that time, over dinner parties, we need each one of us would need to cook up at least 10 jokes about the Chinese dream. <laughs> For example, you need to cook up a story about a boy from you know, the rural background and how frustrated he would be or she would be in reaching the top universities in, 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 in the cities and this is Chinese dream, something like that. Or how can you realize the Chinese dream over drinking instead of going back to your classroom because you won't be able to see them, something like that. So the Chinese dream came up in the context of the social environment is the class structure is getting rigid, more rigid. So early period when you recognize their classes, it's still all right because there's social mobility. Later on you find that you know there's reproduction of class differences and the reinforcement of this in inequality, so you develop another idea of Chinese dreams being everyone being able to mobile, but it's also the message telling you that, you know, the leadership is telling you that they realize that, okay, chances of mobility is reducing. But then, of course, they also promote it as an idea of the emergence of a strong nation. Um, they realize that, you know, gradually China would also becoming um, a dignified and, and, and strong nation again. And so this would related to one by one role, related to broader ideas about, again, competing with other strong nations in the context of a changing uh, economy. Because if you have seen the uh, uh, TV series on the uh, revival of the strong nation, it tells you that you know different historical period would coincide with the Marxist term would be the, the advanced forces of production. If we are talking about the Mongolians, of course, whether you can find the fast running horses and with cannons and, 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 and power, then of course you can conquer Europe. Later on, we will be about the oceanic period. Later on, we will be about the industrial revolution. But now, come into a different stage. And so that's why, you know, um, G5 would be important. And so, you know, uh, the Chinese dream would be possible in the context of China coming back again. That's how I would interpret it. But at the same time, I would emphasize that there are always two messages. What they claim and what you read from the kind of problems that are emerging. So Alex, how, how does, what does that phrase mean to you? The Chinese dream, how do you read that phrase? When did it come out? Is that 2000? 2012, according to Wikipedia. Okay. 
<laughs> you should not use that. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, I record. Uh, if you ask me the question in 2008, then actually I felt like I am a Chinese. But you ask me today, I have a lot of questions. And I could, I could tell you a story, it's like, well, I, I went to the court last year when we were uh, either having an appeal or we were supporting some of the other political prisoners. Then I went to the wrong floor because I had to get a bottle of water for some of my friends. Then I went, say I, I went like uh, I went to the fifth floor from the seven. And what happened in, on, in the fifth floor is like, well, there was another court case going on, and some people were there to support some of our um, police there because like apart from like political prison, prisoners, some of the police were also being accused and charged and they were also put into court. So some of the supporters, they saw me and they just came after me and asked me, wait, hey, are you a Chinese? Hey, how can you do that? How can you occupy Hong Kong? How can you occupy Central? How can you occupy Amatin? This would not be something that a Chinese would do. Then what came in my mind is like, well, um, then are you a citizen from the Qing Dynasty or the Ming Dynasty? Well, when did China happen? When did Chinese exist? Then it's like, well, yeah, wasn't that the, the, the Qing Dynasty before the CCP or even the KMT came into power? Then we went to a very absurd and very illusionary uh, conversation. But what, to my mind, was like when I saw the phrase of Chinese dream or China dream or heard about anything about being a Chinese, Actually, I am very skeptical about what does it really mean to me and to the state, to the officials. It seems like, as Professor Lowy said, it has multidimensional meanings and it could really mean different things uh, depending on who you ask and who say that kind of phrase. And there's a really interesting book written by, I think the author is called Thomas Mulani. I think the person is in Stanford. Yep. And he has written a book about how uh, the minority ethnicity of China actually came into place. And he actually traced all the documents, the archival work, then you could find a very in amazing narrative about, in the first place, actually, CCP was more lenient about the idea of Chineseness. It, CCP was more lenient than its opponent, the Kuomintang, in the first place in the 1940s. But you then, but like 50, 60, 70 years later, you could see the nationalistic discourse and how that was used by the Chinese government to actually make appeal to many of the Chinese. Then that was a really kind of a contradictory story when we like thought about that. Uh, so to my mind, like the Chinese discourse, or like when you when the the question of Chineseness when it was posed, I usually felt like maybe we should go and ask the propaganda department of China, or ask one of the assistant of Xi Jinping, President Xi, uh, Huang Huilin, because he was clearly one of the scholar in China that has a lot of mind about how to use concept, how to use like propaganda to actually defend a lot of social policy in China. So personally, I really have a very mixed feelings about, well, uh, the idea of Chinese and Chineseness. And one last word is like, well, if you visit Hong Kong, you would actually heard a lot of things, especially from a lot of like more uh, radical youngster saying they are not Chinese, they are Hong Kong people, and they felt like they are uh, also ethnic minority, and it is a new nation in becoming, in being, and you can see it's like, well, it is a really complicated issue. So it's, it's very interesting to me that when you pick up on the Chinese part of the Chinese dream, so it's not so much a dream part that you, you comment or you comment on the Chinese part. Um, which wasn't my, when I phrased the question, I was thinking about the dream part, but, but that's very interesting. So I want to come back to this, um, I don't, uh, well, of course, if you start me talking about Chinese, there will be no end to this. So we won't go there, but I do want to ask, in your understanding, this is for both Professor Lin and I, does this phrase resonate with people in Hong Kong, as far as you know, that is, is it even talked about? Is it commented on? Is it something spoken with some kind of, Joy, pride, or um, is it is, is I don't know. I, I, is that is this something that that resonates with people now? 
I, I, I could I could I could I could say something first. Um, I think to many of the people I know, uh, youngsters or some of the um, legislators in the parliament, they were they were skeptical about what does that really mean the China the Chinese dream the China dream. Uh, I think for several reasons. One reason is. Uh, uh, because of the cultural identity, so you could hardly resonate with the idea. And the second part is, it is usually viewed as a propaganda. So it also, like many people, won't take that kind of phrase seriously. Because if you live in Hong Kong, if you uh, read the newspaper every day, or even you go, for, go on social media for news, and many of the uh, report about China that it is usually about shaming or uh, portraying uh, a, a very negative image of China, criticizing the officials and also uh, replicating a lot of the things happen in, in China. Uh, on one level, those things could be true, but on another level, uh, people rarely see like the more nuanced side of China and what was happening in China. But I think that went back to the, the feeling they, they had in mind when they saw that kind of phrase. So that was like my circle, but that was only like a tiny circle. Um, actually, I find it quite interesting that, you know, um, I, I, I did raise the same similar question to some of my students. And I, I got very um, serious response from them. But quite honestly, whenever I meet friends of my own cohort, most people actually continue to ignore it. Because if you know about Hong Kong's culture, one of the very interesting features about Hong Kong culture is that we don't really have a lot of statues of heroes in Hong Kong. I don't know when you, you experience of visiting Hong Kong, you, you, you don't find a lot of these statues. Whereas when I was traveling in, in, in Russia during the World Cup, because I got sets of tickets for the, for the, for, for the last half. Well, in a very popular computer internet-based channel, official channel. I, when I was going around Moscow, or other major Russian cities, one of the things that strikes me is, whenever MTR subway station you get out of it, there's always a statue of anything to glorify a date in the revolution or before the revolution or after the revolution, whatever. You have oversupplied of heroes. And that reminded me of my earlier visits when I was an undergraduate student to, to, to Guangzhou, to, to, to China. Also, you find a lot of signs and, 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 and symbols to tell you that there are a lot of hero in, in, in this society. Whereas in Hong Kong for a long, long time, hero would be symbolized by all the roles played by Jackie Chan. <laughs> the inspector is always the wrong guy. The sergeant right at the front line is always the good guy. Always the nameless small potato is the good guy in Hong Kong. So you mentioned China dreams to my people of my own age. People continue to just ignore it, laugh at it, make use of it. But if you say that, you know, you join a party by citing the word of Chinese dream and you would get a contract, then Chinese dream then. It doesn't really matter. Um, you don't need to take it aboard when you can say it. You don't need to take it aboard when you ignore it. Life goes on with or without it. Thank you. Um, I want to move on to another topic. Um, the Belt and Road Initiative, right? because this is part of the Chinese dream as well, I think. Uh, the Belt, again, for those who may not have heard of it, the Belt and Road Initiative um, was first mentioned in 12, 2013, and it was put into some kind of written form uh, in 2015. Um, and it is the idea of developing, of creating some kind of a network of, of connections, uh, along the old Silk Road, so the land route, and then also a maritime Silk Road, right? the new maritime Silk Road, uh, stretching to, I think, by 
last Friday, straight into Italy, right? That they just signed a, 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 a formal agreement. Uh, so, again, within that framework, the, the, the Chinese dream, what? How should we understood that framework, the Belt and Road framework? And if you think about, because Hong Kong is also part of this Belt and Road initiative. And so what is the relationship between Belt and Road initiative and the one country, two system to Hong Kong as a special administrative region? So basically, matching these two key terms for us. Uh, Belt and Road initiative and one, one country, two systems. How does it, how has it affected Hong Kong? Well, I think there are two layers of answers uh, to, to, to your question. If, if you talk about more general sense, uh, of course, um, uh, Hong Kong actually is not closely connected to the original design of Belt and Road Initiative because it was essentially a way to deal with China's problem of overproduction. It has the problem of overcapacity. The way that they, they, they can afford to continue to build speed rail, basically they can build all the speed rail required by all countries in the world, including Canada, if you want one. Um, basically they can do that because they, they have oversupplied of you know, this kind of production capacity. So in this con connection, Hong Kong is not really a big part of it. Because if you really talk about Hong Kong's financial role in financing projects along Belt and Road, actually you have to recognize that it's actually very, very difficult. Because in some of these countries, there's no formal banking connection between Hong Kong and those countries. And you are not allowed legally to do letters of credit with those countries. So quite frankly, now the official discourse saying Hong Kong would have a big role to play in financing, well, maybe Italy, maybe Germany, maybe Russia, that can do, but a lot of the inner Asian countries actually is not doable, at least up to this stage. So a lot of these would be you know, very official. And then of course I, I'm sure that in the coming years Beijing would find a role for Hong Kong. So nowadays they're talking about assigning Hong Kong, taking up the road of um, um, uh, being a center of arbitration for business conflict along the Belt and Road. Uh, this is simply because Beijing allows you to do that, you will be assigned to do it. Then if you are doing law, congratulations, you won't be unemployed for the next five to 10 years. That's the way they're talking about it. That's one, one level. The other level is, for most of you probably would think that, okay, then you're telling me that Hong Kong is totally out of the picture of Ben and Roll. Quite honestly, my experience is not quite. I must tell you that, you know, in the past 18 months, I've been doing a lot of traveling along the Belt and Road. I've been to Russia, I've been to Kazakhstan, a lot of this country, Mongolia, and so on. And one of the interesting things is that I encounter is, in some of those Belt and Road countries, because now they want to have more contacts with China, and at the same time to get a little bit distant from Russia. So one way is they want to reduce this, the usage and the importance of Russian language and to use more Chinese and English. So they go around and see if how they can do, do that. So I happened to meet a delegation from one of those countries and then they mentioned that they are, they are on the way to Singapore because they want to see how Singapore secondary school and primary schools would teach their students via English of major subjects like chemistry or geography or, or, or history. But then I said, no, my friend, you don't need to go to Singapore. You just need to come to Hong Kong. <laughs> they said, why? Because, well, Singapore actually, this English standard is quite high, and then English is more, almost like a first language. So it's not exactly the same as you want. You want to learn how a country would use a second language to learn major subjects? Don't you find this practice is very pathetic? Use your second language to learn a major subject, right? It's not logical. But that's how Hong Kong study. I grew up in a, you grew up in an environment that you, we use our second language to study physics and chemistry. This pathetic practice 
is well practiced in Hong Kong. So come on, have a look at our school. I'll be able to provide you with consultancy and, and training. I got a contract. <laughs> I got a consultancy job. And so we've been traveling around, doing a lot of these things. Uh, now also including consultancy on Chinese language as well. Um, so quite honestly, um, if you just follow strictly to the Beijing's order and the conception, public Hong Kong would not find a lot of space. I always emphasize that Hong Kong survival depends on going back to our Hong Kong instinct. I don't know how to put it in English, but you need to be Google wah wah. <laughs> you need to be a little bit tricky, you need to be a bit cunning, you need to be a little bit, you know, just trying to play the game, smart. street smart, and, and, and so on and so forth. And you would find certain space, certain opportunities out of a mega project that actually doesn't relate to you. They, they actually parallels, but in the parallel operation, you find something and then you capitalize on such a window. That's how I react to Baron Rowe. I, I just wonder whether the right translation would be smart as than smart. Uh, this is like, yeah, I, I just, I'm just curious, yeah. But if you ask, like, what does one bell run roll mean to a youngster, then it is a really hard question to answer because most of youngsters as how they will respond to most of the Chinese event or Chinese stories, they would just ignore it. One reason is that that just became a habit. They just tend to neglect what happened in China because they felt like it was irrelevant, that they could hardly change anything in China. The things in Hong Kong is, things in Hong Kong are already, are already such difficult, how could you spare time and energy to really deal with China? That was just too far and non-realistic. So to the mind of many youngsters, it was actually so far, far, far away. But on another level, I think that is also true because if we talk about one belt run wall, then who got the benefit? I, I really doubt whether most of the youngest too could participate in the scheme, in the initiative. So far, right now, we could not see any substantial schemes or ideas that actually are being brought up or discussed and debate in Hong Kong that invite youngsters to participate. Like ordinary youngsters, most of schemes, I think you need to have some sort of uh, privilege, you need some sort of network, so you could go through and navigate the field and get to those one belt and reach those one belt, one row countries and, 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 and get your contract and get your partnership and get what was going on there. And I think that is not an easy task and not an easy job that an ordinary Hong Kong youngster or people in Hong Kong could afford. So, the mind of many people, what they felt is like, well, it was always about CY Learn, promoting what the CY Learn was one of the previous chief executive, the city leader of Hong Kong, promoting one bell, one row, and always talking about one bell, one row, and that was always a joke to people. Like, why do you always talk about it? And even some of the reporters, like local reporters, they would just count how many times one bell, one row appeared in his policy address or in his speech, and that was something that like came into mind or became an instant response of Hong Kong people. I think one, one additional potential response to many of the uh, people who are skeptical about the scheme is they tend to see it as uh, a, negative, a negative signal of uh, China's economic development model, whether that will be sustainable or not. Because it seems like, well, the current economic model is not sustainable and that's why it has to transfer the risk to other countries and other regions. And what does that mean to Hong Kong? To many of the people, they would see it as an opportunity, whether there would be more room for reform in the long run, and that actually gave them hope. In that sense, of, of course, that could be also very pathetic. I was, I'm mindful of time, and I, uh, our next topic is on the Greater Bay Area, but I think that might come up in the Q&A session. Um, so I want to perhaps jump ahead, because I, I'm thinking about 
what Alex and, and Professor Lui were saying. Um, if, I mean, part of what I think Professor Lui was saying is that there, there are ways and there are useful ways uh, for people in Hong Kong to uh, participate in initiatives such as Belt and Road. Uh, even though it might be a Chinese policy, but uh, a policy from China, but it is potentially there are room. There is room for, for Hong Kong to, to have a role. Um, and what I hear from Alex is that because it is a policy from China, we don't even go there to think about what what room there may be available. We just because it is from China, it is instinctively you you treat it as from a distance, right? So that leads me to think about what. Um, Professor Mao was talking about when he came here to give a talk a month ago, like some of you were here, and he was talking about the value gap, right? The sort of gap between uh, the younger generation and the, the sort of normal discourse of the government, or at least the, the um, sort of the older generation. That is, if you think about that, what, we, what, what might be considered valuable, that is job opportunities, uh, economic prosperity, uh, greater mobility among the various areas is, is generally a good thing. But if, if, the, if people from the younger generation may not subscribe to that set of, 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 of um, values or attributes, then maybe there was simply no room for, for compromise or discussion. So I guess I want to lead to, to the, sort of the, the, the last of our items, um, which is in your view, what is the, 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 the fundamental challenge facing Hong Kong? I mean, this is a very broad question. I could take us for, but 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 if you so use that as a as as one way of thinking about it, that is um, Belt and Road or Greater Bay Area as, as as an opportunity for Hong Kong. But yet at the same time, we don't seem to be able to talk about it in a fruitful way. Uh, but using that as a direction, what is what do you think is the basic source of problems that Hong Kong is? Well, the same point that I, I mentioned earlier is um, a lot of the assumptions and parameters uh, underlying one country, two systems have changed. For example, I have already mentioned about the um, flow of people, flow of population. It's no longer one-way traffic, it's becoming two-way, and then once it's become two-way, then you find that how are you going to manage it, how are you going to you know, make sure that it, it would operate smoothly, is a very very different ball game, like the um, Hong Kong Macau to High Bridge. When you start considering it, it's nice. You know, Hong Kong can drive to Zhu High within one hour. That sounds very very good. But once it's built, then you think about okay, most of the time they're not interested in going, but they're com interested in coming. Then how are you going to cope with it? Um, these are one of the one of those ch changes. The other changes, like you know, when you design one country to the system. We emphasize a lot on Hong Kong being capitalist and China being socialist. And probably it, it would be a very interesting topic to talk about it is the whole idea behind one country two system is a kind of Cold War discourse. The kind of assumption that, you know, back into the old days you believe that if a former socialist country is to undergo modernization and liberalization, then they would gradually become, you know, someone like us, become more look alike, like the more advanced, modernized society. The typical example would be US. That would be convergence. That's in the old days. So that's why you believe that, you know, by, you know, assisting the re economic reform, that gradually you would have a very different China and, and, and so on and so forth. But apparently it doesn't work it out that way. And in the context of Hong Kong is, at one point in time you think, as long as Hong Kong is still market-based capitalism, then the market mechanism can protect us because our, our counterpart is a socialist state-led economy. So they always being state-led and that's why it's bureaucratic, it's very rigid, whereas if we are market, we are responsive, and then you have to work according to market signal, blah, blah, blah. So we will be safe as long as it's market. But nowadays, the really big challenge to Hong Kong is China can dictate Hong Kong's development via the market mechanism. They literally can buy up all the newly released land for property development. 
like previously in the Kitech area. Now, of course, the company is going to bankrupt and then they, they, they resell the, the, the land at a loss, but you know, they can easily outbid the richest guy in, in, in Hong Kong because the deployment of capital work for other considerations, not only to make money, but also to make sure that the money can move away from mainland and then to put it somewhere out of, you know, the, 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 the state surveillance. So they would come to Hong Kong, use the market to dictate. A lot of the company in Hong Kong now listed on the stock market. Quite honestly, if you happen to be a non-executive director of those kind of company, every day when you receive a phone call, someone representing a Chinese corporation say that they're interested in buying up your company because they need the shell, need your title being listed on the stock market so that they can inject activity as well as capital into your company and then they will be listed on the Hong Kong stock market. So they're interested in buying up your, 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 your company. Once I was involved in, 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 in a company like that as a non-executive director, quite honestly, it's, it's a very interesting experience. Suddenly you notice that, whereas in the old days when you happen to be believing in entrepreneurship, you think being an entrepreneur is about, you know, like Sean Peter said, you need to be innovative, you need to you know, take risk. So you innovate and, and, and make changes to your product. That's the way that you make money, and, as well as being an entrepreneur. Now, I, I, we, we, we have a joke among us when we were running the company saying, wouldn't it be a good idea that you know, we run a company and make some small profit for an extended period of time, and then we get to get it listed on the stock market. And then we can sell it for, well, 400 billion, uh, 400 million. That's a very good profit. Something like that, you know, 20, we can't make the same amount of money for 20 years. And then they take the profit, invest in another small company, run it for another five years, work very hard to get listed on the stock market, and then we get it bought up again. And still we make money without making any innovation or taking any real risk and being entrepreneurial. I'm not saying everyone would think in the same evil way like I do, but I'm just saying that it distorts because of the flow of the money. And it comes in all kinds of areas. When we were in Richmond, I mentioned one example is, nowadays Hong Kong becoming a place famous for cook producing cookies. That for a long time for me is mind-boggling, you know, we are not cookie-making country, we are not supposed to be cookie-making, you know, community, and then cookie is not Chinese, well, fortune cookie is, but, you know, it's not as well, it's US, right, uh, but, you know, it, what are you talking about? But now we do have famous brands of cookies, because of mainland tourists interested in buying, and once I, by accident, I, 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 I drove my car into the wrong car park, and when I come out from the car park, there's a long queue, so I, I can't stop myself by asking these people, what are you queuing up for? They said, cookies. And they said, I never discovered that, you know, in Kowloon City, we have cookies that deserve to wait for another hour. What are you talking about? I've never heard about it. I'm coming from Hong Kong. I'm born in Hong Kong. What, what, what are you doing? And they said, you know, this is good. You know, we're going to buy four boxes, eight boxes for Chinese New Year. <laughs> but again, you know, the scale, we are talking about 51 million mainland tourists a year. It, it, it shapes the market. Not only cookies, but also Chinese herbal medicine. All kinds of things, including vaccine injection. Including, if you look at the figures in 2016, 2017, two-thirds of the newly issued insurance policy in Hong Kong were bought by mainlanders. Why you need to go to a neighboring region to buy your insurance? Don't ask me. It's a very sophisticated question. But you can see that, you know, if I happen to be an insurance agent, you know, it, 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 it's good business. Because suddenly you have a lot of group of people waiting to get, people queuing up to buy insurance, people queuing up to pay premiums. Again, for me, it, this is something that I don't understand. 
I always receive warning letters from my insurance company before I pay my premium. <laughs> because they always have a grace period, right? But now people queuing up to pay in advance. Um, but the point I want to make is, this again is a major challenge. Because in the old days, under the cold water cost, you believe as long as we have the market, everything is all right. Market is such an abstract, big thing, no one can manipulate it, no one can control it. Now, people are telling you that, you know, this is a very small market, come on, we have a lot of money, the money can come in and, and then shape a lot of things. This is something that when we design a basic law, when we design one country, two system, all the way up to year 2000, I don't think a lot of people have paid attention to it, and it's a big, big challenge. Alex, what do you think is the, the, the most serious challenge? Um, to me, uh, I have two hats. One is as a student of geography and as an activist. As a student of geography, I, I respect our traditional and our intellectual lineage. Then I think yeah, really some of the scholars are posing a really relevant question about in the 21st century, it seems like, well, across the region, people really have a different set of question and different set of challenge. And it seems like one country, two system, China and Hong Kong, also have two different sets of questions. To Chinese, the question it seems like it still is how to develop. And to Hong Kong, it seems like, well, why develop? To whom is benefiting the development? That it seems like there to be two contradicting questions that really haunt well the planning of Hong Kong and also the planning of China being incorporated in China's national plan and Hong Kong seems to have a role to really further its economic development and when it came back to its internal resources distribution and how you could care better for the local population there seems to be another set of issues and I feel like this is really unresolved and I don't know what, what kind of future is ahead because I feel like this is a real issue. That what kind of city and what kind of nation are you envisioning? And whether the way that is about well, well, massive industrialization and industrial products, whether that is still the way that the world works today, whether that's ecological, whether that's sustainable, and whether that we could survive all the crises that are being warned by the experts, I really have doubt about that. And I think that is a real question that we rarely talk about it or bring it into the horizon of Hong Kong people where we debate about the social policy and the economic policies. And as an activist, I felt like, well, there's another set of challenges. One is about trust building. Another is about censorship, no matter like, well, are the censoring your will or you self-censor yourself. To my mind, like over the years, especially after the umbrella movement, well, people tend like people tend to have a more polarized ideas and tend to use more labeling to kind of understand the world and understand one another, and that seems to become a practice in Hong Kong, and that creates a lot of difficulties, kind of make obstacles and hurdle ahead of any conversation. And without any conversation, that is actually really hard to think about alternative and how people could come back to the table and really think about okay, how could we co-work and future an alternative. And uh, that seems to be the case among the pro-democracy camp and also across the camp. Well, if I happen to like have a conversation with people who are labeled or claim as the provision camp then either I or the person who are from the probation camp, they will be in great trouble because they will be challenged, well, whether you are still loyal to your, uh, your, 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 your peers, your supporters, and whether you could be trust any longer. I think that is a real challenge. Then, if that's the case, whenever you receive an invitation, then perhaps you will hesitate you will have a lot of doubt whether I attend this event or have conversation with this person privately or publicly whether that would damage my reputation or damage my career or damage my projects that I attend that might need the donation from different people or need the collaboration 
from the official government, and that becomes a huge issue. That kind of put on the way of many potential progressive projects. Trust building and conversations and dialogues, and this is what we, well, I don't, but trust conversations could be what, what we're doing. So I'm mindful of time, so um, how do we do the q and I think um, you may have to walk up to the mic. So uh, let's, let's try this way. So whoever wants to ask a question, we can use this phrase, because we need to take your voice to raise it. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah. So the floor is open for questions and answers. Oh, no, I answer is it questions or comments. Yes. The other way around. Or the other way around. Can we, can we bring the mic? Maybe I'll, yeah, maybe I'll pass it. So you can then, the same view, the walk. Yeah, questions and Hi, um, I'm Irene Pang. I'm based at the School for International Studies at Simon Fraser University. Um, I just had a follow-up comment on um, going to the, the original question about the, the challenges of one country, two systems, and I, I appreciate the, um, the comments that have already been raised. I just want to put it out there that there might be another complication that we have not explored yet, which is when we think about one country, two systems, the, the system isn't dichotomous. It, it isn't just capitalist versus socialist. There are two dimensions to this. There's an economic system, and then there's a political system, right? And empirically, the empirical, uh, the economic and the political don't have to align in any particular way, right? Um, we see, for example, in India, it was de democratic before it became capitalist. In Latin America, we see that the connection between capitalist marketization and democratization is really messy. It goes back and forth. But then, in Hong Kong, and definitely outside of Hong Kong, there is this persistent um, expectation that somehow um, capitalist marketization, especially in China, will somehow lead to democratization. Um, and that, of course, is derived from teleological Eurocentric um, experiences, right? But there is still this conflation of the economic and the, uh, the political. So I thought that was something that we might want to think about as well. Well, I think this, this is a very uh, important and in interesting remark. Thanks very, mu very much for that. And, and I, I tend to think that that echoes my point on the, um, um, this kind of Cold War discourse behind the original one country, two system uh, design. And if you have a chance to read the basic law, then you probably understand uh, how Hong Kong people at the early 1980s tried to cope with that problem. Uh, because I think inevitably, you have the fact that you know we 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 are human beings. We we always have our own limitations. So the way they we, we look at the challenge in the early 80s was so much based upon early experience and perception of China, as well as how you understand what would happen afterwards. So the focus was at that time, I feel to say, very much on on capitalism versus socialism as two entirely different economic systems. And that's why we, we spend a lot of effort in defining as well as make sure that private property would be well protected for Hong Kong people after 1997. So if you have a chance to read the basic law, there are more than one clause on private property. And in one of those, I forgot which one, it actually gets into very, very detail about how future government cannot confiscate private property with any excuse. Quite honestly, when I was reading that article, it strikes me that it, it, it must be written by people who or whose parents have the generation of going through the five NTs campaign, you know, land reform, so that they know that, you know, it's not directly taking away your private property, but they can cook up reasons, and then they can take away your, 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 what you possess. And so they get into all these details. But when it comes to, like what you said, there's another dimension about form of government. Then you don't find a lot of stipulations related to that in, in basic law. And in fact, you don't find a lot of 
very detailed delineation about the relationship between central government and the future SAR government. When they spell it out, it always focuses on several dimensions of it only. It is about money. That Beijing cannot tax Hong Kong. They cannot take away our reserve. Local district or provincial organizations cannot set up their offices in Hong Kong without getting permission. It's all about protecting Hong Kong from the central, about taking away resources from Hong Kong only. And you don't have a lot of details about what if, after 997, the relationship between the central government and some kind of a local government. Then how would that relationship be worked out? That part was actually quite empty. That then I think, exactly because of some of the assumptions that you just made, or the so-called Cold War discourse I mentioned, that you know everyone assumed that maybe 15, 20 years later, during the course of economic liberalization, then probably you don't need to deal with it. But of course now, like Alex just said, you know, now it all strikes back. Who said that you know private enterprise will replace state enterprise? Now you have even more powerful Yong K, right? Who said that you know gradually you would have a civil society and so surveillance will not be part of everyday life? Now you have a facial recognition and scan your face right away. Once you believe that there would be a middle class, and because of a middle class, then you would have liberalization. But we have a new middle class in China now, but it doesn't mean that they're interested in democracy. So yeah, a lot of these things come back. And um, so yeah, Hong Kong would be a very interesting case for international studies. <laughs> <laughs> so you just want to be interested. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, there are two groups of people in Hong Kong which are very, very interesting. One group of people is like, actually, they're from mainland China, but they did education in Hong Kong. I'm not talking about one-year master, I'm talking about like four-year bachelor or five-year PhD programs. And lots of them, they stay in Hong Kong. They apply for permanent residency. And when I studied at UST, like 15% of students are from mainland China. And the other group of people are actually they are Hong Kong people. They were born in Hong Kong, but their parents, like I mentioned, are from mainland China. And these two groups of people, as far as I know, they are not accepted by both mainland China and Hong Kong. So China think, okay, you're Hong Kong, you got education, brainwash, whatever. And the Hong Kong people say, ah, it doesn't matter, you, you're from China, your parents, all the things. But actually, these two groups of people are lots of people. Like, like, it's still a minority, but they're growing, like 25% or something. But their voice I tend to be ignored at both parties. I'm one of them, and I just want to know what you think of these two groups of people. I, I, to my mind, Hong Kong is always a city of discrimination. Um, <laughs> I think that is surely one of the case. Uh, if you look beyond the face, the, the color of your face or, or your, your skin, then you can also see a lot of ethnic minorities. Actually, they also stay in Hong Kong, they are, but they are like invisible. Like one of the speakers who's visiting uh, UBC, uh, Fifth Act. So the person uh, who will be speaking at UBC for some of the talk show in, 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 in the coming days, then he, if you talk, if you ask him, then he actually felt it was really difficult to stay and, and live in Hong Kong because you have different sort of discrimination. And I agree, that also happened to the yellow face, yellow skin people because of different culture, because of different experience, then you could hardly be accepted to some of the communities. And I think that is one of the challenges. Uh, but I tend to see it as the result, then like the cause of like what is happening in Hong Kong. So I, I do want to also explore what kind of potential and opportunities could we have. Because it seems like now it is a conundrum. Uh, there are insufficient support to students who study in the University of Hong Kong, but they're usually being separated. The local students and the non-local students, they would not mingle together. That's the case in every university. That, that was already the case when I was in university uh, in 2011, and that is still the case. 
And I think that is something really about like not only the politics and the, the, the economy of Hong Kong, but also about the culture of Hong Kong people and how the whole educational institution are set to kind of facilitate more conversation. Uh, Professor Loy would have more thought on that, I'm not sure. Uh, but I do tend to see it that way. Uh, I think that the politics and the economy simply complicate the whole issue and make the conversation more difficult. But I also do see a lot of conversation happen. There is some conversation, but not many, unfortunately. Well, third quick response would be, um, I well, I, I recognize the, the issues that you, you, you mentioned. But at the same time, I would also like to hear more from not only the two groups, but perhaps more more groups um, of diverse background to to articulate their views, to articulate their experience. For example, I, I do have a lot of students coming to Hong Kong to do their undergraduate studies and then continue to stay behind and, and, and so on. So I was the uh, editor of a book called Gong Piu. Um, and, and, but I would be very interested to see how they would further articulate the experience of, you know, living in Hong Kong for, for, for a certain period of time. For example, one of my students actually, uh, last time when we have dinner, one of the conversation it came up is, uh, how would I define her as a person now? Because she came to Hong Kong around the age of 18 to start doing her undergraduate studies. She had now already completed her PhD in Hong Kong and then moved on to become a, 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 a assistant professor in one of our local universities, and then he has been, she has been staying behind for a number of years. So almost approaching the age of 40. So more than half of her life actually in Hong Kong. So now I'm asking her the question that, you know, it's a Hong Konger, what do you think about this? And she's telling me that, oh, growing up in Beijing, I would think that what your, your question would be, something like that, and so on and so forth. So how would they articulate would also be interesting. And this, in turn, if, if they're more willing to speak out, I, I do think that it would have an impact on um, the, uh, the, the dialogue in Hong Kong. That's uh, kind of behind. So I just got a simple question. We're talking about Chinese stream today, right? So if Professor Lloyd or Alex, you have ever had a chance to propose a Hong Kong, Hong Kong dream, what would it about? Mm -hmm. Well, I think in... <laughs> That's a good question. I th uh, quite honestly, I, I, I do think that it, it, it really uh, very much goes back to one of the biggest challenge uh, to Hong Kong, um, you may say, even before 1997, is gradually, I think Hong Kong's own experience of development, the original sources of engines of growth and, and, and so on, my own argument is, is, is almost come to the exhaustion uh, by the time around year 2000. Um, we cannot repeat the same story again and again. Whereas my people of my own cohort, uh, we live in a period of time when Hong Kong has high economic growth, and then is a loosening of the social structure, and also at the same time that you, know, you, 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 you have multiple pathways for social mobility, so you don't need to re just rely on credential in order to, to, to move up. For example, I still like to quote the example that you know, when I was a secondary school student, when I finished my, the first public examination in the secondary years, it's the, uh, the, the fifth year public exam called school certificate exam. Mm -hmm. When I finished it, I was allowed to continue to move on to a level and to move into university. But before getting into university at that time, because you know only 3% of the same cohort would get into local university. So the chance was very slim, right? So when I was doing my sixth form, I had to struggle with the idea that whether I should continue to study or rather to start working. And I have a very good friend who did the same O-level exam. And then he started working in a hotel, originally as a bellboy. So every one of us used to visit him on Saturday and weekends and laugh at him because he's a bellboy 
in those days you have to put on the cap and and then dress up as a bellboy as a bellboy and, and you say that you know you look silly but then the point is by the time we were in our six seven form before going to the a level exam he became a concierge manager of course in a freestyle hotel there's no big deal but then he's put on his suit have a salary increase and seem to be doing well at that time when i was about to take my a level exam i thought probably he, he has chosen the right path right he got a job decent job and then salary improved and he knows where he's going whereas i'm still struggling with my a level and then i have to pay my school fee but then of course now when we sat down together and have a chat i noticed that i'm doing a lot better than him because by the time he arrived at the age of 50 he is so well paid in the hotel sector that he is supposed to be the first one to get rid of because it's about retiring getting old slow down but well paid so he was fired to graduate so towards the end of the story of course i think okay being a professor is still better and then struggling with a level is of course the right choice but not in 1975-76 um, so we have a, a certain model for realizing certain kind of dream in the old days you can be a small factory owner you can be you know a bellboy and then a concierge manager and so on and so forth now of course the structure of the hong kong economy is very different um, is becoming increasingly single track and then you know is very much of high-end producer service high-end financial and business services so basically it it rules a lot of people in the process and that's a big big problem and that's a big problem for quite honestly Glicker Bay Area initiative as well because when the government is promoting Britter Bay idea well the response from Beijing and, and, and Guangdong is telling you that they are interested in giving more benefits to the so-called higher tier professionals from Hong Kong but not talking to the general public um, so nowadays when we talk about Hong Kong dream of course it's a big challenge how are you going to provide different types of dream in plural for people again in plural form that would be a big challenge uh, what's the Hong Kong dream I think there are so many components that we could it is really about futuristic project then I do feel like a lot of people in Hong Kong they are working on alternatives and one of the closest project that connect me is actually about how we rethink the relationship between humans and land I think that's really one of the key issue in Hong Kong how could we develop the city in a way that's really about freedom that's really about equality and um, I would say I have one more hat because when you ask this question as a Buddhist practitioner who kind of inspired by their belief I think one of the very real cause for humans to think about the future is how do we reduce suffering suffering is actually one of the great cause that makes people suffer and painful then how do we treat that if you really contemplate it and really take it seriously well you really want to avoid suffering then how could we make it possible in the policy context in the planning context in the economic context i think that is one one two key and one one way in rethinking how could we rethink the future of hong kong and that actually is something that i would like to think along because i do feel like there are a lot of policy that really create a lot of suffering because when i think about my my dad like he is more than 70s then could he be well taken in hong kong while he aged that is a huge question and when i think about my brother then he is doing college does he have a future if he choose to stay in hong kong and work in hong kong could he afford the housing could he really find a job that is meaningful could he uh well engage with a committed relationship with his partners that's a question and also my, my like i also have a friend that she gave a birth to a baby just right today will hong kong still be there 20 years later or 30 years later i think that's a real question 
that's not, not a full question because in terms of one country, two system, or in terms of whether, well, the student level would just keep rising, would Hong Kong still be there as one of the coastal city? Then that, they are all real challenge. Then I think those crises, when you flip it over, then see how you could reduce suffering and make people and make rooms for people. Then I feel like that is one of my Hong Kong dream and one of the projects because I feel like we need more room and opportunities to, to, to make people thrive. It's not just about survival, it's also about how we could thrive all together. Thank you. Um, I'm mindful of time. So um, perhaps this is a good place to end. That is, um, as communities, we how can people dream together? How do you accommodate 7 million dreams and put them into one dream?